Welcome to the final installment of a Spy and Axide series. This episode is called Defiant Until Death. If you've missed episodes 1, 2 and 3, you can catch up on those on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible and other audio apps. This series is about the former British spy Martin McGartland who infiltrated the provisional IRA during the late 80s and early 90s in Northern Ireland. Due to the serious threat still on Martin's life, his voice has been altered and this has been recorded over a secure connection. I don't believe for one second that an IRA active service unit just decided that we're going to jump in planes, trains and automobiles with fucking guns, ammunition, disguises, getaway car, getaway van, mobile phones, scanners, properties to hide in. I don't believe for one fucking minute that they would just be able to do that without MI5, special bunch of the RUC fucking knowing what they're up to. And what I'm saying to you is, right, could it not be, and I believe this is what's happened, the special branch or MI5 knew what was going on, but they just thought, we don't want to be getting involved in that. And that's what I believe. He thought that you were just another problem for them and it would have been easier if that problem was to go away. Visualize this. The police know, they're fully aware that IRA members are going to kidnap somebody who works with the police, i.e. me. The following day, the police know it's going to happen. They've got advance warning. They can put all the resources together, and they've got many resources back then. You know, the OUC, without doubt, like the PSNI, PSNI today, are probably one of the most sort of uh, professional police forces in Europe, if not the world, because of what they've had to actually like be involved in the whole way through the troubles. You know what I mean? They've got the best of everything. And what I'd say to you is this, right? When they had 24 hours warning that I was going to be going to a meeting, quotes, close quotes, they knew full well, as Ian Phoenix mentioned in his diaries, that they knew that I was going to be going to be kidnapped and interrogated and debriefed and obviously no doubt murdered by the IRA. They, they knew that. But what happens is, right, they actually fucking had a surveillance team watching me, and that too has been confirmed in Ian Phoenix's diaries. He says quite clearly in his diaries that Carl's movements were watched by a surveillance team, and he was observed getting into the fucking Sinn Féin Centre. And then, so what I'm saying to you is, everything I've been saying since 1982 John Moore programme has all come to fruition. I didn't know that Ian Phoenix was going to keep personal diaries. I didn't know Ian Phoenix was going to be getting killed in the Shunuk helicopter crash. And I didn't know that his wife was going to publish his diaries. So what I'm saying is, everything I was saying in 1992, it was all starting to basically come to the public domain. Quite a number of the things that I've mentioned about my case have actually been um, corroborated by other people, whether it's been somebody who's actually came forward to say, well, oh, yeah, yeah, I get tipped off about uh, a, a bombing or a shooting. And obviously, it was obviously him because he's mentioned about it. And all, and obviously, I was the person who was the fucking, the, the, the actual target or whatever. But the point I'm making to you is, right, come back to what I was saying, it wouldn't be the first time. It happened in, 1990, in August 1981. I could have been fucking rescued. I could have actually been fucking, like, saved. And the people who had me could have been arrested. But they weren't interested in doing that. Say if I was to be shot tomorrow, the people who shoot me will never, ever, 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 ever have to worry about getting arrested or ever getting convicted, or ever serving one minute, or one day in prison. The law of this land does not apply to me. It does not apply to me. It doesn't cater for me. No one could ever imagine what it's like to keep on getting told, you're not going to have this. You're not going to get this. You're not entitled to this. We're going to make sure you don't get this. The security services got my bank account closed down. They got my partner, Kerr's bank account closed down. Actually stopped, closed down. And when I write to the bank, they say, why, 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 don't give me no information. And and it just, it just, it, it's ironic that only recently I was reading in the, in the Belfast Telegraph that 
people who are Republicans are allegedly involved in Republicanism. They're also saying that the security services and the cops got their bank accounts closed down too. That's been happening to me. I've also had fucking people coming, investigating me, like people relating to like benefits and stuff and all like that, for uh, payments given to my bank account. And the payments were paid to me by the fucking security services. And they're recording me. They're saying to me, come on now, you have to tell us where this money's coming from. I can't. Oh, you have to, we're investigating you. I really can't tell you. Oh, well, if you don't tell us, it's going to be a big full investigation. I say, look, if you turn that tape recorder off, I'll tell you. Oh, we can't turn the tape recorder off. So I have to actually tell these investigators from the benefits, different benefits agencies, look, I'm going to write something down in a bit of paper here where this money came from, but I can't say it on tape. And I look at these people, and these people are looking at me, and they think, is this guy nuts? And I scribble on a bit of paper, M, I, five. The people who told me they can't turn the tape recorders off and they won't turn the tape recorders off told me immediately, we're suspending this interview. And then they become very polite. And then within a couple of days, they're asking me to come to their office to give me copies of all the tapes and all the transcripts of every conversation they've had with me in the court. And they're sending me away telling me how sorry they are. And it was the security services who did that. I've got an ongoing court case at the minute going against MI5. And it's been going since 2011 or 2012, right up to the present day. It's been going for the past fucking 10 or 11 years. And I'm not joking you about, right? It's all to do with them actually withdrawing my medical treatment. On their MI5's advice, I could not go and be treated through the NHS because of security issues and stuff like that. So they had agreed that they were actually going to get me private medical treatment. Now, that was a choice they made, yeah? And obviously, like, what they done was they were really, really sleek at the way they did it. I was living in the Northumbria Police Force area, and I was on their fucking armed protection, up to, like, a dozen police officers looking after me, like, at one time. Now, when I say a dozen, I don't mean a dozen, like, standing around me, basically, every time I went somewhere. But if, if I was... In, the safe house or the safe, it was actually a police station. They kept me in a fucking fortified police station. But what happened was if I worked to work with the uh, firearms officers, there was at least three firearms officers with me in a car and another fucking car behind with at least another three. So you're talking about at least six people there. But there was other people who were doing other things at the accommodation and stuff and all where I was actually staying. But because it, be, because it got so expensive, which is fuck all to do with me, because do you know the, the fact about it is, I didn't even want to be staying with fucking the Thumbria police. I knew that they were rotten to the fucking core. I knew that they had fucking smeared me whenever I was fucking shot. I knew that I could never trust them, right? But uh, it was just basically, you know, it was better the devil you fucking know. I was in really under serious fucking threat uh, to my life. And I had just basically been shot fucking at least six times, possibly seven times. And I actually couldn't fucking basically refuse the protection because I knew somebody may come back and try and finish me off. So when I was with these people, I actually had a great deal of respect and I know the firearms officers respected me but the fucking police themselves like Northumbria Police and the Chief Officers I didn't trust them, I didn't like them and I wouldn't fucking do, you know I, I wouldn't normally even I got involved with them, but it was just because of circumstances. But I'll tell you this whenever I was there because it was getting so expensive to look after me, they were actually leaking fucking stories to the press. This is how devious the fuckers were. I was sitting in this police safe fucking accommodation one day, and one of the firearms officers walked into me and threw a fucking paper down in front of me. And it was a local paper, and it was on the front lines. It was on the front page. Something words to the effect, I'm paraphrasing here, what uh, you're paying the taxpayer to protect me. Over one million pound? Now, what the fuck's that got to do with me? Do you know what I mean? I didn't ask to be shot. And if the fucking police had it in uh, malicious prosecution in 1997 that I was acquitted of, I was acquitted within fucking 10 minutes by a jury after a four-day trial. 10 minutes, you know I'm absolutely acquitted. The fucking cops took me there because it was a malicious prosecution. What the fuck's it got to do with me how much it costs for my protection? I, I can't dictate how many people's going to look after me. I can't dictate, you know, the way they're going to go about doing it. So the point I'm making to you is, because it was so expensive, Northumbria police wanted rid of me very, very quickly. And they were doing everything in their power to try and get me 
out of their fucking um their, their, their sort of protective sort of like environment. And what they were doing was them and MI five were basically fucking doing a bit of horse trading behind the scenes. And what they were doing is um they were actually fucking trying to put pressure on me to move from Northumbria out, go with MI five and go to a brand new lo- location for a new identity. But you know what happened? I was very reluctant to do it because I was shocked that on the first new identity, the first time round, and I wanted all sorts of assurance to make sure that all these different safety things is put in place. But they made it so difficult for me that I had to accept that I had to leave Northumbria Police Protection and went with MI5. But you know what? See, from the minute that I went with MI5, all the promises that they made to me, right, they just fucking slowly by slowly kept on fucking basically squeezing me and squeezing me and squeezing me until such an extent that the relationship just broke down. No trust. Really, really fucking bad, bad relationship. And and you know what the fly fuckers did? Because they knew that I couldn't really go into the benefit system. Now, you need to remember, I'm heavily disabled and I can't go into the benefit system. So what they said to me, we will pay the benefits that you and your partner, Kerr, are entitled to. In lieu, we will pay that to you. The state, MI5, will pay that to you. And what happens is, I says, well, that's okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then what happened was, because I'm speaking about my shooting, and because I'm speaking about about my kidnappers, I'm not going to name them, because I'm speaking about my kidnappers, they didn't like that. So they said, if you keep on speaking about these things and stuff and all like that, we're going to basically pull the plug on the monies that we're giving you. And I say, hang on a minute, you're not giving me no money. You're paying me my benefits in lieu because I can't really fucking claim them because obviously I have to go and explain away how I've got all these injuries, blah, 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 blah. So long story short was they did fucking stop all them payments were paying me and they left me and my missus were no state benefits that we were legally entitled to for 12 fucking years. 12 years. Was there a particular news article that you had contributed to that sparked that i done a story it was about do you remember the two brothers who went super cross i think it was uh um something to do with loyalist paramilitaries and, and, and they became super crosses that was the trial involving belfast brothers robert and ian stewart who in 2011 were the key witnesses in what was Northern Ireland's largest paramilitary trial for 25 years. The background to that is that in 2008, the Stewart brothers walked into a police station and confessed their part in a brutal paramilitary murder in 2000, and that was the shooting of loyalist Tommy English in front of his wife, young daughter and twin sons. The two self-confessed UVF men agreed to give evidence at Belfast Crown Court against nine other men they say were in the same gang and also involved in the killing. Basically, in legal terms, they were assisting offenders, but on the streets of Belfast, they were known as supergrasses. In return, they were given a heavily reduced sentence for their part in the murder of the UDA man, and the brothers got a three-year jail term instead of 22 years. They were released from prison that year in 2011, and it is not known where they are living now. Yeah, well, what happened was, them two brothers, I read in the paper, and I, I, I commented on it, and I more or less said that, you know, fucking people shouldn't obviously become super grasses because obviously, like, you know, fucking they get used and abused and they'll never be looked after, and I said fucking... Once they actually do what the state expect them to do, they'll just drop them and fucking basically like cast them adrift. Which is true. It's true. They've done it to Raymond Gilmore and they've done it to the other fucking people too. So what I'm saying is I'm entitled. I'm entitled to say it because of what I do. I mean, if I had a went and said, oh, everybody should become a super grass, the MI5 are lovely, wonderful people. They look after you forever. They're really king. They'd have been fucking going out of their way to give me fucking like, you know, anything I wanted. But because I'm speaking my, my, my truth, that's what I believe. They decided that they're going to stop it. And how were you told that Marty that they were they were pulling everything from under you, that your money, benefits, everything? How how were you informed about that? On the phone. And do you know the funny thing about this is too. I mean, this is one thing I need to go back a little bit about. Right? They already did pull money, 
relating to my medical treatment, which resulted in the court case that I'm telling you about that began in late 2011, early 2012. It's still going on to this day. But what I'm saying to you is, right, that there relates to them actually withdrawing that medical treatment. And like I said to you last, when we spoke earlier, uh, the, the security services, whenever they decided that they were going to take total responsibility for me, what that means is, right, in legal terms is, right, that the duty of care to me as one of their former agents, right, that duty of care losses for my whole lifetime. That's the way it is. It losses for my whole lifetime, yeah? I'm their responsibility. But before they took overall control, I was theirs and also Northumbria Police's responsibility jointly, because at that time I was living in the Northumbria Police Force area. But the minute that Northumbria Police passed me over to MI5, and at the moment that MI5 took responsibility for me, then Northumbria Police was out of the picture. But when MI5 took me away, they promised me, like they did when they come to see me when I was in the hospital after the shooting, Two of them came to my hospital bed and they said, look, we're going to make sure you get locked off and stuff and all like that. That was after the shooting when they knew I was nearly fucking dead. But what happens is whenever Northumbria police passed over possession and fucking um, MI5 took me away for a new identity, right? It, it was at that stage that MI5 had actually already told me that they were going to make sure that they lock off their future medical treatment that they knew that I needed. Because, I mean, think about it. I'd just been shot a minimum of six times. I had really, really fucking serious, serious fucking issues, you know, psychological as well as physical. And obviously, they weren't going to go away, you know what I mean? So what I'm saying is they knew all that. But what they done was, when they got me away from the Northumbria Police Force area, and when Northumbria Police was, like, rubbing their hands quickly saying, like, sort of, fuck him, he's well gone. He's not our problem no more. MI5, all the promises that they made, and not only the pro pro promises, but morally they had an obligation to basically fucking look after me because of the position I was in. I couldn't walk into a hospital and explain away my injuries. I couldn't afford to pay for private fucking medical treatment. They had said to me, we're going to get to the at medical treatment. And they paid for me to actually go to see a psychiatrist because of the psychological uh uh, you know, difficulties as a result of the shooting. Before they did that, when I was actually in the Northumbria Police Force area, they were already doing that. I was seeing one of their, um, uh, a psychologist, and their psychologist gave them a report to say that this guy needs to have extensive treatment from a psychiatrist as quickly as possible, and he gave them a report, so they knew all that. But long story short is, whenever I moved, to the next location, my second new identity with MI5, they decided that they're going to pay for uh, psychiatric treatment. And I think they paid for 10, I think it was 10 sessions. Now, when they paid for 10 sessions, that was to allow the psychiatrist to assess me, because obviously this guy had never seen me before. He didn't know fuck all about me from Adam until obviously he, I was referred to him by MI5's psychologist who was actually seeing me in the Thunbury Police Force area. So when he assessed me over a period of fucking weeks, he done a report at the behest of fucking uh, MI5, and his report said very clearly that this man has got serious, serious psychological traumas and, uh, you, you know, disabilities that he said that are going to take several years, several years to actually treat now, it was clear as up, so he kept on treating me, for, obviously, for them 10 treatments, and near the end of the 10th treatment, the security services were given another report. He said that he, believe, he now believes that the treatment I re require will be a minimum of three and up to five years of treatment. Three to five years. That's what he said. So he went from several years to three to five years, and then what happened was I was going through a compensation claim with the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board for Vince for Shap. And the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board asked me to ask the MI5 whether or not they were going to continue to pay for my psychiatric treatment. And MI5 wrote them and said, no, after the 10 treatments is run, we're not paying no more. So from that moment, for the reasons I just gave you a minute ago, 
may not been able to get treated through the NHS, as may not been able to fucking obviously even contemplate doing that. I had to just go away, and I had to basically like you know live like to the best of my ability without any sort of treatment. All the medication that I was on from that psychiatrist and the psychologist before him when I was in the Northumbria Police Force area, it all stopped virtually overnight. I just, my case got deteriorated, deteriorated, deteriorated to such an effect extent that my disabilities became really serious, like psychological, so serious that they become permanent, yeah? And I end up with all sorts of fucking problems and then that's why I have to take them to court. You were shot six times. The psychological impact of that I, I couldn't even begin to guess. Physically, what injuries were you left with? Well, the injuries fucking mostly, my injuries now, the way I am at present time, are like hands, problems with grips. I couldn't do anything which basically re- requires the use of like using two hands together. I couldn't prepare a meal for myself. I can't tie my own shoelaces. I can't like, you know, do up like my own buttons, like in a um like a pair of trousers or like a shirt or stuff like that same thing stuff like that i couldn't i can't cut my own fucking fingernails believe it or not that sounds obviously like pretty significant but the actual psychological issue and the 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 the, the actual problems that i have psychologically and stuff like that are fucking much worse than that you know when i look back to the person that i was on the life that i led before the 17th of June, 1999, the person who, who I now am is a complete fucking shadow of the person I was then, and it's got worse as year go, every year goes by. So how are you getting help, Marty? Well, I don't get no help no more, and the reason why I don't get no help no more for is because they stopped all the fucking, um, they stopped all the payments, all, all of the um, funding. Through the funding, in 2000, I think it was September or October 2001, now, bear in mind, this is what's so shocking about the whole thing. I only moved away with them into their sole control. I think it was in April or May 2001. In 2009, because I had spent years fighting, 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 they then reinstated funding for medical treatment. Well, too little, too late. I, I then goes back to the same psychiatrist. And he wrote in his report that this man, to actually go and function as a, a normal fucking person every day, right, is like now on impossible for me to do. But how do you survive, Marnie, with no money? At the minute now, I'm actually able to actually get like benefits and stuff now. But to get the benefits, yeah, I had to actually fucking go and I had to do all sorts of stuff because things were getting so bad and so desperate after so long, right? And without any help from them, I had to go and seek help from other people. And fortunately for me, yeah, a, 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 a doctor who basically like is just like a, a GP, you know, actually like helped me to be able to get some evidence without compromising what I was involved in and stuff and all like that. But that in itself also has caused me problems because I shouldn't have ever, ever had to go down that route. I should have been able to use fucking go and rely on the people who I actually give so much for. They've tried to punish me at every fucking stage, but not only me, also my partner, who's also my care. Say if I didn't have a partner and somebody who actually was prepared to stand by me the way she has, right, for the past fucking 22 years, the security services would have been up shit fucking creek because they'd have had to fucking do everything. But fortunately for me, and fucking probably fortunately for them too, they've had an easy fucking sort of... uh, life. Everybody else is doing all their fucking dirty work. He spoke in depth about North Humbria police and the issues that that you have with them. When you when you got your new identity and you were moved uh, at a reported cost of 1.5 million, when did you decide that you wanted to make a complaint against North Humbria police? My first complaint that I made about against North Humbria police was virtually within probably weeks of my shooting. But Northumbria Police never, ever, ever took any of my complaints seriously. I have been making complaints against Northumbria Police continuously 
continuously because different things have been coming to, to light. And when I find out more and more stuff, then I'm going back and saying, right, I want to make a complaint about that. But none of the complaints I have ever made have ever been properly investigated, nor have they ever properly fucking like been dealt with. Because it's so serious and so toxic, and because it goes right very up to, to, to the highest level, I'm talking about ministers, government ministers, who actually were in the Home Office or in other government departments, Going right back to 1997-1998, my case went to the very, very tip-top of the British government. And then when the Blair government got involved with Mo Modem and all these other people when I got shot, then there was other senior people involved in it. So what happened was, right, when I got shot, and then they decided, they thought, fuck me, what are we going to do here? We were telling everybody that he wasn't in danger. We were telling everybody that he was going to be like quite safe to stay in this area. And the IRA wouldn't obviously like the IRA weren't going to be any sort of like a threat and blah blah blah. And then here he is now, firstly left left in the back fucking lane, bleeding to death. I mean, how are we going to explain this away? And their way of explaining it away was they thought, well, we'll just say it was drug dealers, it was a local feud, and say he was involved in it. But that was when they thought I was going to fucking I wasn't going to survive. When they knew that I'd survive, they, they had already fucking leaked that information to the press. They knew they had a problem because they knew that I was going to find out about it. I take it they didn't expect you to fight back to McGill's allegations in the first place? Do you know what? I don't think they cared, Trish, because one thing you need to remember, you know, visualise this. Anybody who's listening to this, anybody who was around and interested in, you know, the events of 1989 knows that everybody was been told that the IRA are on a ceasefire. Everybody was talking about getting the IRA decommission their weapons and stuff and all. And more importantly, anybody who was taking an interest in the, the, the actual the news and what was going on at the time also knows that Mo Modem was actually fucking visiting IRA terrorists, UVF and UDA and fucking all other sorts of people, terrorists and paramilitaries, in the fucking Mays Long Cash prison. Talking about no, you know, you know about the peace process and stuff. No, she was in there with them, and so was other people too. I mean, it, it's fucking common knowledge. There's all newspaper coverage of it. So, and, and there's also video fucking sort of footage of it. So she's in there, a government minister meeting all these people, and what happens is they're doing it because they believe the IRA is on ceasefire. But one thing that you need to remember is this: for the IRA to actually to say that they were going to send an active service unit who actually, I believe, was in that area, in the Newcastle-upon-Tane area, for about a week or probably more, to send them to the mainland, the GB, to actually take out somebody who was one of the... Uh, 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 who had infiltrated their organisation and done enormous damage. For them to go and do that, knowing full well that it was going to become really, really big news, because of the peace process and stuff like that, they took a massive, massive gamble. But the question I would always ask is, why did they think I was so worth falling that was going to happen as a result of my fucking shoot? The IRA must have fucking believed that I was worth that sort of fucking uh, risk, because I've still never been able to understand why they did that. Was it because they were told, well, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, internal housekeeping? Because that, that's, that's what the actual theme was at the time. When the IRA were killing people back then, people knew they were doing it. But the government were going, oh, well, you know, it's internal housekeeping. That's what the fucking government was saying. Their own citizens were getting murdered by the IRA. And the government were going, well, you know, it's just internal housekeeping. Well, do you know what? Do you know one thing I would say about this? It's a little bit off the fucking beaten track. But what about that person who was connected to Russia? I think it was in Salford. Whenever fucking Putin and... Russians come over and they poisoned that man and his daughter. The both of them survived. Was that would that be regarded as internal housekeeping on behalf of the Russians? A spy or whoever who he was. He was they went to try and assassinate him. He survived, quite thankfully, him and his daughter. And what happens is the British government says, Oh, you can't come into our country and like, you know, like murder people or try to attempt attempt to murder people in broad daylight. And then there was another guy who the Russians actually Whenever they actually, uh, he was an ex-spy, 
they actually uh, poisoned the man, and the man actually physically died. But he was in his hospital bed for days before, before he died, and he was telling about how it was the Russians and how it was Putin who poisoned him. And the British government were going ballistic. They were going ballistic. But yet I, as a spy, a teenage spy, who the fucking British government and MI5 and Special Branch fucking groomed, trained to send me in. I was an accidental fucking spy. I didn't ever want to go into the fucking IRA. I had no intentions of getting into the IRA. But they said to me, oh, you know, we want you to go and infiltrate that organization. And I very reluctantly didn't want to fucking do it. But because they were so per- persuasive and because obviously I thought, well, you know, fuck me. I mean, I'm working for them. I, I-, I like a fucking idiot, obviously, like, you know, just basically fucking went. And I, I actually did it, uh, which was probably one of the biggest mistakes I ever fucking did. Because as I say to you, I mean, under normal circumstances, I would have never gotten involved with the IRA. And I would never have gotten fucking involved with Special Branch either. If I had known that, I would have fucking know. So the point I'm making to you is, the fucking British and the British government are total fucking hypocrites. And hi- hypocrisy is just basically fucking eye-watering. They're quite happy to go and shoot and squeal and ball when any other state goes and fucking basically breaks the law, but yet they break the law at will and they're allowed to get away with it. For anyone who who doesn't follow you on social media, you do have Facebook pages, you have a Twitter account where you regularly post updates about your ongoing cases and your issues with Northumbria Police, MI5 and the security services. They can be easily found. But in a nutshell, with Northumbria, Marty, how many complaints did you make against them? I couldn't even fucking guesstimate how many complaints I've made, but I can tell you this. It's probably at least, in total, I would say 40 to 50 different complaints in the past 22 years. And I'm, I'm telling you something. My case is so stinking that the IPCC, which used to be the Independent Police Complaints Commission, which is now called the IOPC, they have been uh, what I would regard as uh, very, um, I would say the IPCC and the IOPCC have not acted in my interest at any stage and have also, uh, in my opinion, and I've got evidence to back this up, they've also been very, very sort of uh, totally biased towards the police at every stage. And obviously they would deny that, Marty, but you feel that you've just been ignored at every corner, no matter where you turn to, that no one has your interests at heart. I met two Canova officers and they brought a document with them, right? It was only, it was a two-page document, but it was only really one page because it was like an A4 piece of paper and I've got it in front of you here. And this document is actually on my Twitter page, so anybody who's on the Twitter page can talk and see it. I was meeting Canova because I thought that I might have information that may assist their investigation into this so-called spy called steak knife, who, uh, incidentally, you know, in my opinion, I believe is a bit, a little bit of a fucking red herring. I mean, I don't believe that the steak knife has ever been as important as what they're making it. But they had this document. These two Canova officers had this document, and. What happened was they pulled it out, and one of them was actually like, you know, sort of like, show me it. Now, the document wasn't meant to be actually given to me. They they, they made a point they wanted me to read this document, yeah. Now, I believe that they gave me this document, and I believe they prepared this document, and I believe that they even brought this document to the first meeting that I was having on, because they probably believed it would actually, like, sway me. I'm sitting in, like, a, a restaurant with these two Canova officers. And I'm reading this document, right? And to me, because of what you've said about like me not being believed and me not obviously being able to get any sort of proper sort of like treatment. And the first paragraph of this document reads as follows. Anyone who has read or researched media in relation to Martin McGartland will be aware that he has suffered a great deal, both physically and mentally. As he details, This has been compounded by him being repeatedly let down and not supported by the various authorities involved with him in the 1991 forward slash 1989 on since. And it says, with this in mind, it is essential for the officers from Operation Canova, it says, proposing to interview Mr. McGartland to reassure him of the following, and then the list 
about five or six different bullet points about they're going to get people, so I'm going to have a contact, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, when I read that, the hairs in the back of my neck stood up. And people may think, well, why? What's so significant about that? And I'll tell you what's significant about it. Because here I am meeting police officers, because that's what the Canova officers are. They're police officers. And they're working under the direction and control of John John Butcher. John Butcher then was the um the, 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 the chief constable at Bedfordshire Police. He's not no longer, he's actually since retired. But he's still ahead of Canova. But when I'm meeting them, John Butcher would have to obviously authorize that. Everything would happen in Canova, he would have to basically have side of it. My reading of that document is that these people are more or less saying there is information to show that I am known to have been let down by the powers that be and different authorities. The point I'm making is I reckon that that was done quite, quite purposely. And I reckon that Canova did that because at that time, I was very, very suspicious of Canova. And the reason why I was suspicious of Canova for was because I have been dealing with every single major organ of the state since way back in 1991, after I jumped out a window to escape from the IRA. And every time I've dealt with all these different organizations, there's not one organization anybody can name to, can name to me that hasn't either had direct or indirect involvement with me personally or my overall cases. So when I went to meet Canova and they said that, that's the reason why I believe that was put in there for a reason, obviously, to try and basically butter me up. And the reason why I'm saying that for is because I've had a big fallout with Canova and also John Butcher, which I'm happy to speak to you about later on. And what's in there and I, yeah, is completely at fucking odds with what they actually did and the whole time I've actually had involvement with Canova since 2017. So the point I'm making to you is, yeah, you're completely uh, on the ball, what you've mentioned, about my, obviously, case just hitting one brick wall after another brick wall after what, another brick wall, roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. No matter who I've come into contact with, see the minute that you look, when you go right into the actual heart of what these organisations are, one thing is always actually really, really at the centre, and it's always a government state organisation which is funded by the state. And no matter where I fucking go, if I go to the police, they're actually controlled by the Home Office. If I go to Canova, they're working under the direct and control of the Home Office, and they're funded by the Home Office, the government, and also the fucking PSNI. If I go to the PSNI, government, if I go to the RUC, government, if I go to uh, fucking any other organization, like the PPS, they're all basically all little sort of branches of the main fucking state who I've actually had all these difficulties with. So in other words, what I'm saying to you is, right, no matter where I go, I'm fucked. Is that hard to psychologically deal with, Marty? Do you know in life, whenever you have a on hard time, the only thing that you've got, in my view, is hope. I realised a long time ago that Hope doesn't exist in my circumstances, my life and my existence. Because hope, you know, I hope somebody's going to actually say, fuck this, we're going to make sure we do this without fear or favour. And we're going to make sure we actually, you know, get a closure, get a resolution. I gave up hope long, 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 long time ago. And, you know, most people, you know, that's all they've got. Hope. They hope that somebody's going to do the right thing. Years ago, I was the type of person who was so, so patient and so, so, like, happy-go-lucky and polite. See, now, when I'm dealing with these people, I just haven't got time for them. I just give them both barrels. If I believe they're involved in corruption, I'm going to call them out. If I believe they're lying to me, I'm going to fucking keep repeating to them and keep reminding them that they're lying to me. And some people don't like that. I believe if I was actually to be taken out tomorrow, without any hesitation whatsoever, it'll be as a result of, at the very least, complicity by the people who are supposed to be protecting me. And what I mean by that, I don't mean, oh, they're going to come up and say to somebody, here's a gun, go and kill Marty. So, Marty, we've touched upon Operation Canova throughout this podcast. It's came up quite a lot. And for those who don't know what Operation Canova is, it is yep. an investigation that has been set yep. up into the IRS Nutting Squad, which was 
the unit that carried out punishment attacks and also murders of many people, including suspected informers. Can you tell me about your involvement? Were you contacted by Operation Canova? Did you do that yourself? And and what happened? I didn't even know anything about uh, Operation Canova. What happened was I had been reading a news, an online newspaper article, I think, from memory, it may have been the Irish Times. And when I was looking at the story, it was mentioning about this operation coming over and how it was actually looking into all of these sort of allegations about a uh, spy codenamed Steak Knife, which, you know, side issue I want to mention. I mean, you know, dirty war by name, dirty war by nature. I honestly do believe that fucking this steak knife may be just a bit of a red, red herring, you know. And to me, I'm not convinced that, you know, anybody who may uh, or could have been an agent, you know, inside the IRA at that level could actually have been able to actually pass on any information to uh, his handlers that would have been of any sort of significance to the security services, whether it be Special Branch or MI5. And, and I mentioned this to Canova. I, I'm going to go back, but I want to mention this, obviously, while I'm on the subject. The reason why I say that for is because I clearly remember me saying to Canova when I met them that, you know, this state knife, I says, if this person, which they are lead, lead, leading people to believe, was somebody who was a, um, a spy, who was actually inside, allegedly inside the um, internal security unit. And he was like, sort of like one of their tip top agents. I think to myself, well, hang on a minute. If somebody's inside the internal security unit of the IRA, they wouldn't be in any sort of position to be able to forewarn their handlers, whether it be special branch or MI5, about forthcoming mm-hmm. or future operations are planned sort of operations that the IRA were actually like you know preparing because simply you know people in the internal security what they do is right they actually um investigate interrogate torture and then as everybody knows execute people who they claim are agents and informers so the, the point I'm making and the point I made the kind of was I can't see how somebody in that position would actually um be able to have any sort of information that would be of any use to any of the uh, intelligence services because, you know, if you're interrogating somebody who's an alleged informer or an agent and you're interrogating that person, there's no way on this planet that information that you're going to get from that person about events uh, that they were involved in or IR operations, which have already been past tense, they already happened. Many, probably many months ago in the past or maybe even years back. I mean, giving that information to the um, security services isn't going to save any lives. So to me, it, I, I didn't understand why the, it was so significant. But going back to um, your question about Canova, I was reading an article on the um, internet and I'm certain it was the Irish Times. And when I was reading that, I was reading about this you know, independent organization who was going to be coming in, they were going to be doing, like, you know, a real, real thorough investigation and stuff and all against uh, the whole establishment, whether it be MI5 or OUC, PSNI, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was saying all about, obviously, how they were actually going to be investigating a large number of um, murders for um, past people who had been allegedly murdered because the IRA claimed they were informers or agents. So I thought, Jesus, I'm going to look more into this. So I've done a little bit more research. Um, long story short was, I actually found out, in fact, I think, if my memory serves me right, I think that the actual um, newspaper article actually had a telephone number on it. Anybody with information, contact this can over. So I actually contacted them by telephone. I called them on the um, 13th of April, 2017. That was the first time I contacted them. And when I contacted them, I explained to you, the guy I spoke to seemed to be pretty, pretty sort of like obviously interested. The conclusion of our conversation was that he was going to go away and speak to P. 
people, and I later sent him some information and documents relating to my case. But my main reason for contacting them were two reasons. One was obviously the fact that they were investigating the internal security unit and the fact that I am the only person who I am aware of who actually was kidnapped by the IRA internal security unit and basically was obviously still around to tell the tale. So I thought to myself, Jesus, I mean, who better for them actually like to be able to glean some sort of like insight into that sort of like uh, stuff and that, the activities of the, the IRA internal, internal security team. So I actually um, sent them some information and he had mentioned to me that it was coming up to the Easter holidays and he said to me, look, you know, would like to be able to sit down, speak to you, obviously meet up and obviously introduce yourselves, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, after the Easter holidays, and I said, well, in principle, I would agree to it, yeah. But because of my background and also because of my um, difficulties, and, um, you know, when I say difficulties, um, I'm under, obviously, egg in the pudding here. You know, I actually uh, was very, very paranoid and also very suspicious because, you know, I automatically knew, well, hang on a minute here. These people are obviously connected to the establishment, establishment in some shape or form because, I mean, they're all, my understanding was they're all connected to, like, the police and, you know, serving police officers or ex-police officers, etc., etc., etc. So I was very suspicious. Um, obviously, I wasn't going to be, like, be very trusting until somebody gave me good reason to trust them. So I uh, obviously like sent them some information through emails. They emailed me back and we were sort of like corresponding between ourselves. And then what happened was I had been asked, obviously, would I be prepared to go and meet them? And I said I would. But they started to talk about me giving a witness statement. Now, I was very, very clear, and this is very important to this particular sort of um, story. I wanted them to be aware that I would only actually um, meet, speak, um, give them a witness statement if I was given an assurance that I would be given a copy of all of the information that I had given them, because they, they did tell me, obviously, around that time or shortly after, that all of the all of the witnesses and all of the people who was actually assisting them would be recorded, audio recorded, onto a like uh, an SD type of memory card. And then that would be taken away and it would be transcribed, put in the statement. And they said, I think it was a section name statement, which is a legal binding sort of witness statement. I think it was section name, but don't, don't quote me on that. And they said to me that whenever I give, if, if I give this statement, they said obviously it'll all be tra transcribed and it'll all be put on the proper sort of like transcript. And if, if they believed that I had to, like, it, it had to be used for a proper witness statement, then they said that I would be asked to check it and then sign it. So I, I said right in the way, I, I, I just laid my cards on the table and I said, listen, to tell you this, I obviously have had loads of difficulties with one police force or another or one sort of like state agency or another i says when i give them information uh you know i made the point that i i, I was not very very happy about the way the information was actually handled and dealt with i said look you know information that i give people were taking things out of context or they were actually like using it for their own sort of uh purposes and they were actually using it in some cases to try and like you know question what I had said or what I was trying to actually, like, you know, do. And I thought to myself, look, if I'm going to go to speak to these people, I want an assurance that I'm going to be able to get access to all that recordings and transcripts, even if it means after your investigation is complete. Now, I could tell at a very early stage that they were sort of like, they weren't saying no, but they also weren't saying yes. And based on what their decision was going to be on whether or not I was going to be able to actually have access to that at the end. And I couldn't see no reason why I couldn't. I said that would make me decide on whether or not I wanted to be 
involved in it. They went away, and I was told that the guy that I spoke to was going to go and speak to John Butcher, who I now know, obviously, is the head of it. And he says he'd go and obviously take advice and run by blah, 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 blah. They more or less told me that, look, I couldn't record it, but it would be recorded. And they said to me that so long as John Butcher actually gave permission, then if he agreed to that, I would be given access to the audio recordings and also the witness statements and documents that they actually prepared as a result of any meetings and interactions with me. So what happened was I actually went and um, I uh, kept on sending messages back and forth. Kind of, well, this was going on from April up till I think probably um, maybe June. I think it might have been June. And what happened was that was in 2017. And John Butcher was very reluctant. They actually give me uh, written, because I asked for it to be in writing, confirmation in writing to say that, yes, you, I'm agreeing that you can have a copy of uh, the statement that you give, but obviously after the investigation is concluded. So I actually waited, and at the end, uh, obviously, all the correspondence and stuff and all I got, it was virtually within 24 hours of the time and date that I had uh, arranged to go meet the people to actually give the interview, I got an email from John Butcher. And the email that he sent me for the assurances that I was actually, I had been seeking from him, he more or less said in that email that I could have it. As a result of that, I went and I actually um, agreed to go to a meeting with his officers the following day. I also was under the impression that here I am, somebody who had already been kidnapped, held at gunpoint, and also virtually would have been tortured and then killed had I not have escaped from the IRA internal security team. I knew that I was one of probably very few, if not any at all, other people who was going to be in a, a unique situation and a position to be able to actually assist them. But I was also obviously very, very aware. And I was also hoping that if these Canova were the real deal, and there's no reason to believe that they were not, because obviously I only got in, in contact with them, obviously, a short period before. I, I, I believe that if they were the real deal and they had all the, 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 the people's uh, victims' best interest at heart, then they would actually act on all the information. So I also believed and I also uh, thought that they would actually be like investigating my case. What happened was, whenever I actually um, agreed to go, to actually meet them, I spent the best part of an entire day with them, giving them all the information about everything relating to how I first went into contact with Special Branch, how I was recruited, made the point, pushed at home, that I was not like involved, connected with, a member of the IRA or even sympathetic to that organization prior to me actually beginning to work for Special Branch, and certainly not before I actually uh, agreed to infiltrate the organization. I explained to them that I was virtually, like, you know, sort of like planted. I was actually directed and persuaded the, to virtually infiltrate the IRA, and I made the point, like I always have done that I was very reluctant to do because I didn't ever want to be involved with the IRA. So I was also mindful that these people had, you know, completely no hold, holds barred, sort of like unfettered access to every aspect of everything that was humanly possible to access all records for OEC, all records for PSNI, Special Branch, MI5, British government, army, I knew they could get whatever they wanted. So I knew when I went there, I had to be completely straight with them, which I always would have been, tell them everything that happened, as I remember it, tell them everything that I knew, and I knew full well that when they wanted to start actually go to actually corroborate my story and to actually, like, you know, verify it, they would go and say, hang on a fucking minute, tick, 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 tick. Everything he's been telling us, obviously, is all obviously like down here in black and white because there will be records. So long story short was, I actually went, spent the whole day with him, 
told him all the stuff. And then jumping forward, I actually went back uh, probably only about a year ago or even probably even in the, in the last six months. And I had mentioned to him, look, can you please tell me when I'll be getting a copy of uh, the statement and the thing and all I'll give you and all? Because obviously, you know, the likelihood is, from what I understand it, and people may have different views from me, but my understanding is the way John, Bro John Butcher's talking now. When I first seen his public statements, I couldn't believe what he was saying. He was saying stuff like, and all you know, he would be very, very angry if he wasn't able to get prosecutions at the est at the end of his investigation. That's what he was quoted as saying in the papers at the very early stages in 2016 and 17. It's in black and white. And then now he's starting to say, oh, you know, it's going to be difficult to get convictions because of the passage terminal. It's like two different people. So when I was reading all these things, I thought, hang on a minute here. This guy seems to be flogging a dead horse. So I'm back and said, listen, when would I be able to get access to my uh, statements and all the recordings? And I was expecting to be told, look, Marty, obviously you were told that like it was after the investigation concluded, which would be acceptable to me. And I'd say, OK, no problem. Or I, I was expecting to be told, no, you can have them because we're not going to be using you as a witness. So therefore, they're no, no longer of any use to us. And, and because you're not going to be a witness, obviously, it wouldn't be prejudicial to the actual investigation. So I was expecting to be told that. What I was told was, Marty, we don't give people copies of the statements and stuff and all like that. There, We're not allowed to. Words to that effect. Now, I've got emails to verify that too. But top and bottom of this, I thought to myself, fucking hell. I mean, I have, here I am once again, and I have actually been sort of like duped. And that's me being very, very, and been polite to John Butcher and been polite to Canova. If I had my way on this fucking interview, I'd be saying a lot more. I have sent in multiple press queries to Operation Canova over the last two years about the claims that you have made. And I have not received a response. And that includes the claim that you were gypped. Now, I'm sure John Butcher would deny that you've been gypped. But we have put that to him prior to any article that was published with those claims. And we didn't receive any response. Just last month, the Guardian newspaper reported, and I'm sure you've read this article, about MI5 being forced to hand over secret files on Northern Ireland operations to John Boucher. And he is quoted as saying... Uh, in relation to Operation Canova, that we've recovered records that other investigations previously commissioned were not provided access to. We have access into MI5, into the military and into the PSNI. Direct access. It's something I insisted upon, having spoken to a lot of those previously led legacy investigations. It's realistic to suggest that some of the access that wasn't provided years ago was because of the proximity of those investigations to the conflict. There were a lot of people in those organisations leading those organisations who were affiliated to a side in the conflict and therefore they made it hard to get the material. I'm sure you read that article. How do you feel about Mr. Boucher's comments? My opinion on that would be this, right? If John Boucher is more or less saying, which my reading of it, and if, if I'm wrong, then correct me, but my reading of that is more or less, John Boucher's more or less saying that information that would have been very, very important, as well as relevant to past investigations, I presume, and again, it's my own opinion, that he's referring to Stevens 1, Stevens 2, blah, 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 and stuff like that. I mean, John Boucher is a public servant and John Boucher has got a duty to the public, not to like other Crown or, or other civil servants or Crown servants or public servants. And what I'm saying to you is, right, if the public are entrusting John Boucher to the tune of over £30 million, now I know this for a fact because I've made a Freedom of Information request and only recently the OUC stroke PSNI have been covering up information that I had been requesting. Now, it's on my Twitter feed. Anybody can see it. It can be checked, verified. 
and they wouldn't disclose information. I asked, please tell me how much the, 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 the PSNI has spent on Operation Canova since 2016-17, when it began, up until the present day, 2022, on for each year in between. They wouldn't give me the information. They made all sorts of excuses. I actually went and made a complaint to the Information Commissioner's Office, and the Information Commissioner's Office wrote to the, RU, the PSNI and said to them, look, you have to deal with this request properly. And then only recently, I actually got a reply, and they give me all the information, and it, it, it turned out that it was as close to £35 million pound as you can get, or just a little bit over. And the thing that really astonished me the most about it was some of the actual figures for 2021 to 2022. Now, I don't know how they calculate their years. I don't know if it's April to April or December to December. I don't know that. But what I can tell you is, for the, for, for the past couple of years, going back 18, 19, 19, 20, 20, 21, except were all in excess of five to six to seven million pounds. Now, the way they're talking, and the way John Boucher's talking recently, where he has said that he hopes to actually publish an interim report within the next coming months, right? An interim report means just that. If the security services, which I believe they will, and the PSNI, and also the Home Office, and other sort of, uh, you know, figures who basically, you know, carry out all their sort of activities behind the scenes, if they actually try to delay this and obstruct this, right, Canova could be still going on for the next two or three years. So you're talking about probably in excess of 40 to 50 million pounds. But the reason why I'm mentioning that for, and the reason why I'm going off, obviously, track for is because of this. When the public are spending 35, 40 or 50 million pounds, potentially, the public have got a right to know exactly what people have been doing and you know they, they, they have a right to actually know if people within the police whether it be the PSNI the RUC or MI5 or other government departments have actually been willingly and you know deliberately misleading fellow police officers i.e. John Stevens or others so what I'm saying to you is I mean if it turns out that John Boucher is actually saying just that, and I don't know, I'm only going by obviously the article you're reading, but if he's saying that somebody potentially, allegedly, or whatever you want to say, has actually like, you know, hoodwinked Stevens 1, Stevens 2, and whoever and whoever, right, then that is pretty serious shit, because some of these things have actually been dealt with legally through the courts, and they've actually been subject of actually um, legal sort of proceedings at one, one time or another. And it would mean that people have actually probably potentially made have broken the law. So the point I make it is John Boucher is duty bound in law and he's under a legal obligation to make sure that he is after any individual who may have broken the law, irrespective of who they are or what sort of position they were in and any of those organizations, whether they're retired or whether or not. And he should basically go after them without fear or with figure and with, uh, with fear, fear or favour and, and with figure. The first meeting I had with John Boucher was was to do with actually Canova. But almost immediately, in fact, it was probably only the next day, I thought, look, hang on a minute. This guy's like a breath of fresh air. He seems like a genuine guy. He really had convinced me. He was fucking like, you know, firstly, like, you know, the fucking... The, 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 he, he was going to fucking go out and if there was any nastiness involved in this state knife for this fucking government sort of any government sort of like shenanigans gone, he was gonna be the person who was gonna fucking find it and he was gonna go and he was gonna prosecute people. He had me convinced I was fucking he had me on the hook. I, I, I believed everything he was telling me. So what I'm saying to you is I mean that meeting I had with him was relating to Canova, but the next day I actually to say because I was so impressed by this guy, I knew that Northumbria police allegedly had been trying to convince me, and for the record, I didn't believe a word the fuck Northumbria police was saying, I never have done. They were trying to convince me that they could not find any police force in the whole of the United Kingdom or any chief constable who would take on an independent investigation of my 1999 shooting. Now, I didn't buy that. So what I was in a situation here was not as back of what I said to you earlier on, but here I am in a situation 
where everything, the law, the rules, and the law of the land and all the regulations don't apply to me because my case is just basically like a fucking poison chalice and nobody wants to touch it because it's so toxic. So I thought to myself, look, Northumbria police are trying to claim that they can't find somebody to take on a review. This guy I just met yesterday seems to be fucking a genuine bloke. That was my true, true belief at that stage. The first meeting I met John Butcher was the 31st of May, and that was the first time I met him, and that was relating to Canova, and that was as a result of my my first contact with Canova after I read that article I told you about, and I think it was the Irish Times, and I spoke to the guy, and he says to me, look, we'd like to meet you after Easter holidays. So that's how, that's how the meeting with John Butcher came about. And that was him trying to convince me that, you know, if he can come in and obviously help us, you can trust us, blah, 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 blah. And then, obviously, as a result of that, meeting with John Butcher, and because I was so impressed by him, and because I fucking thought I could trust him, I actually had sent the email the next day on the 1st of June, 2017, saying, look, is it possible that you may consider, obviously, like, uh, looking at taking on a review on behalf of, like, Bedfordshire Police as a chief constable of my... 1999 Northumbria Police Investigation shooting, and he agreed obviously to do that. But what happened was, as a result of him agreeing to do that, he then said to me that he was going to actually use one of his officers from um, Bedfordshire, the had Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire, and Hertfordshire Police as all one part of one organisation. It's all like a collaboration of three forces. And John Boucher said to me that he wanted me to actually um, speak with one of his, it was a head of crime. The guy was the ACC, a guy called Paul Fullwood. And what happened was, he said that he wanted me to go back and meet him and Paul Fullwood as a result of the fucking, um, as a result of the uh, agreeing to take on this review. Now, by that time, him and Paul Fullwood had already been fully briefed by the chief constable and the deputy chief constable of Northumbria Police, either at meetings or on the telephone or in correspondence, emails or whatever. So they knew everything they needed to know. And what happened was I went to a meeting with them. Now, I haven't got details of when that was. If you want, I can get it. I can get it. But the meeting took place, like, obviously not long after the um, 1st of June sort of fucking um, email that I sent Austin to consider, and he agreed. So it would have been a matter of maybe a week or two off that. So it would have been sometime in June, I think. So what happened was, I actually um, had met them. And when I met them, I said, look, you know, if you're going to do this review, are you actually going to do it where there's going to be no sort of fucking shenanigans whereby, you know, if there's foul play on the part of the security services, special branch, Northumbria police, you know, it's going to be fucking completely open, transparent, no balls in the book. You're going to be completely upfront with me. And John Boucher, is exact words were to me, and also Paul Fullwood, and this was repeated, because Paul Fullwood was the go-between between me and John Butcher, because John Butcher's very busy, being the chief constable of, obviously, Bedfordshire Police, and also the head of Canova. He said that Paul Butcher was going to be the go-between between me and John Butcher, and he was also going to be, like, oversight of the investigation. But John Butcher made it very clear, and he gave me a copy of terms of reference, that John Butcher was complete overall, control of the review. But what happened was, him and Paul Fullwood told me, look, Marty, we will actually review your case in its entirety from the minute that you were shooting, the minute you were shot, until the up until, he says, from the minute you were shot on the call went through to 999 cops and emergency services, summons and stuff now, up until I think it was October. The cutoff point was October um, 2017. That was the cutoff point. So 99 right through to 2017. And he also told me, I said, will I get a copy of the review report? That was very important to me. And he said to me, yes, you will get a copy of the report at the same time as Northumbria Police get it. It's going to be completely no balls in about what we find. We will put it in the report. We will report our findings in full, and you will get a copy, Northumbria Police will get a copy, and then what happened was, long story short, at the very end of it, see whenever John Butcher was given a copy of a draft report, things started to turn really, really fucking sus, 
re I mean I could tell. I remember vividly, I mentioned to you previously that there's certain things that trigger uh stuff in my head. And I remember vividly a message that I sent to John John Butcher, and I've got a copy of it. And I said, John, ever since you've been given a copy of the draft report and the review team's findings, your attitude and that of Paul Fullwood has changed very, very significantly. And I remember he wrote back to me and said, Marty, there's no change of attitude for me. And he was more or less saying that I've been completely straight about this. And then the next thing I hear that the fucking report had been changed. And I wasn't supposed to fucking probably realise that, but because I was asked so many questions and because I was questioning all these different people and stuff, no, I was fucking bamboozling them. You know what I mean? And what happened was I was finding out there was changes to the report and stuff. And I thought, well, hang on a fucking minute. John Boucher and Paul Foodwood told me at the meeting that when I met them, uh, it was the second meeting with John Boucher, but the first meeting with Paul Foodwood. They told me at that meeting that the people who they were going to get for my review were people who were no longer serving officers, but they were brought back, they were retired, and they had been brought back by those three forces because they were so good at the job. They were reviewing officers, and they were giving me the impression that they were the best of the best. And yet John Boucher told me later on that he had asked for the report to be changed because terminology, he said, stuff in the report didn't really make much sense to him. And I thought, how can you tell me professionals on that scale who were reviewing officers, who had retired from the force, who worked in the major investigation team, who reviewed cases, who were brought back because they were so fucking good at their job, didn't know how to write a report, and didn't get their terminology right. And then he was saying, oh, look, Marty, you know, um, if you come down, we'll discuss the findings. And I said, John, no, I'm not coming anywhere to meet you. I want the report, as you promised me. I want to read it. I want time to consider it. And then I'll meet you and we'll discuss it. And that was when everything went, everything went sour. So when did you actually pull your statement? How long after that? It, probably, I can get the exact date for you, but it wouldn't have been long after. It was probably within weeks or probably just a few months. Because the reason why is I was desperately, desperately hoping that John Boucher would honour his, his, um, honour his um, promises to me and his assurance. The head of Canova, not the head, the deputy head of Canova, actually sent me a letter on the 3rd of February 2021, right? And what he said in here, and I bear in mind, this is after I'm really, really kicking up a fuss. This is after I withdrew my system, my statement that you're talking about. I withdrew that statement. So this is the reason why it's relevant to what you've just asked me. They, they wrote to me, and this guy said this to me. He says, Mr. McGartlin, you notified Operation Canova on the 26th of the 10th, 2020, of the fact that you uh, suspected that your abduction, uh, which occurred in Belfast in 1991, was linked to Operation Canova terms of reference. I am writing to let you know, it says, what action we will take as a result of this notification. And I am also seeking your help in connection with that case. I have attached an email it says of the, the full terms of reference for Operation Canova investigation. These can also be found on the Operation Canova website, along with very helpful updates on details of the investigation on the over, oversight uh, that covers the conduct of the investigation. And he just reads all details to me about, like, obviously, what that entails. But he goes on to say this, all cases referred to Operation Canova remain, quotes, under consideration, close quotes, until such times a link is established directly with the published terms of reference. You need to be aware that we do not have the ability uh, or, or a mandate to investigate cases unless a link with the published terms of reference uh, to Operation Canova can be found. So he's more or less telling me, obviously, that um, they're looking at my case to see whether or not it actually does uh, comply with their terms of reference for state night, for fucking, um, you know, the, the overall terms of reference for, um, uh, you know, the Operation Canova investigation, which I thought was fucking really a bit crazy because I had met them, remember, Vernon Ming, I had met them as early as May 
June 2000 and fucking um, 17, I think it was, 2017. And what happens is, when I met them, they're sending me this letter, like, fucking in 3rd of February 2021. So, to me, it looks as if everything I told them, which I believed, was given to help them with the investigation, but also for them to go to look, actually, to see if they were investigating my kidnappers, my kidnapping the nothing squad involvement, my kidnapping, which I believe was happening behind the scenes. I believed up until the stage that my case was already been fucking investigated. So what they're saying to me is they're going to go away, they're going to carry out a review to see whether or not it's actually going to be like part and parcel of the overall Canova fucking investigations on if it's compatible with the fucking overall Canova terms of reference. Um, basically, they're more or less telling me, we'll get back to you, blah, blah, blah. But what they've done was they actually kept me waiting, kept me waiting, kept me waiting. But after that, that letter was on the 3rd of February. They're telling me that there's going to be a review of my investigation. Now, to jump forward, the review that they're referring to, right, has just been completed. It took, I think it was 17 months, I think it took, in total. It began, I think the review that they, they, they said, uh, they undertook began in October 2020, and I was told only within the last couple of days that it was completed. And they told me that they had an update for me, but the guy told me, look, Marty, I've got an update for you, but I'm going on holiday, and I'll be back next week. And I, I, next week came, and I didn't get no fucking update, so I wrote to him, and he wrote back and says, oh, Marty, listen, I'll just tell you that the, there's been a report sent through to the PSN, and we're waiting to hear back from them. He says, and I'll be back to you with an update in the very near future. So there's no fucking update. So I'm still waiting to see what report they've sent through to the fucking PSN at. It'll be interesting to see what, what it was because it was like 17 months in the making. And also they uncovered, Canova uncovered fingerprints uh, relating to my kidnapping from the flat where I was held of the people who abducted me that the OUC had told me and told the PSNI they had lost. Now there's also another story that the Sunday World actually uh, published back in 2011 and it was called What the Hell Are the Cops Playing It? And it was written by John Cassidy. That's on my Twitter feed too. And it tells you on there that the fucking cops said they'd lost the fingerprints uh, relating to the ones that recovered from the flat where I was getting held. And lo and behold, John Boucher starts doing fucking uh, a review and an investigation and he finds them right away. So what I'm saying to you is, I'm sorry for bombarding you here, but this is also significant. I also got another letter from them which was relating to me, Keaton, sending messages through to John Butcher. Please give me the report. Please honour the promises. Please, you know, you know, honour the assurances you give me. You're going to give me a copy of this report that you told me you would give me into your review, into my uh, Northumbria Police investigation of my shooting. Now, one thing I should mention here, which is also, obviously, I forgot to mention earlier, is that when I met John Butcher and he was making all these promises to me also too, when it came to the stage when he started to see how serious this all was, when the review officers were passing on their findings, because you need to remember, they spent months and they had complete, full and open uh, access to everything relating to Northumbria Police's investigation, all the stuff relating to my case, and they found out everything that, that there was needed to be, to be known about my case. And they were reporting that back to John Butcher. Well, what happened was he would have started to realize, fuck me, this is a bit serious here. I don't want to be starting putting all this stuff up in a report and give the dear mom Marty after I promised I would do. So what John Butcher started to do then, when I started to really, really put pressure on him, reminding him about his promises, he said, look, Marty, uh, you know, I can't really give you a copy of that report because obviously it was Northumbria police who asked us to do the review and we're really working on their behalf. And really, it's down to them to give you it. He says, but as a compromise, what I'll do is I'll go away. I'll do a redacted version of the report. And what I'll do is I'll do it in a way where there's not going to be that many reductions. But, but I'll be able to give it to you with a compromise in the actual um, integrity of the investigation or, you know, the review that's been carried out. So people, suspects, names won't appear in there and blah, 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 this bullshit. And I thought, well, okay, yeah, I'll agree that. So he goes away and he gets his reviewing officer who actually carried out the review, a guy called Mark Ross, to go away and do a redacted uh, uh, copy of the final 
review report, and that was for all intents and purposes, to be able to be given to me without actually compromising the official review uh, report that they had written, which was over 100 pages long. So that was what we had said, right, OK, I'll, 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 happy, I'll, I'll accept that. Then what happens is they come back to me a way later saying, oh, you know, we can't even give you that. It's down in a company of police, but you're going to have to go back to them. They're going to have to agree to give you because it's their report. It's not ours. We're only the review in force, blah, blah, blah. So I started really bombarding John Butcher with emails, reminding of all his promises, reminding of previous emails about without fear, favour, we'll give you a copy of the report. Keaton telling me if we find any suspicions of any... Uh, uh, he says, if we find any evidence or any suspicions of wrongdoing or foul play, we'll act on it and we'll basically report on it. And we'll take action, blah, blah, blah. I kept reminding of all these things. And then I get this letter, again, from John Butcher's deputy, who's the deputy head of Canova. And this was sent to me on the 6th of August, 2021. And this is what it says. Dear Mr. McCartland, I write with reference to numerous email messages sent through to Operation Canova in recent months. These messages are concerned with two issues. The first concerns the review con conducted by Bedfordshire Police in 2017. Now, no, there's no mention of John Butcher. It says, at the request of Northumbria Police, into the circumstances surrounding the attempted murder of you in 2000 and 2001, well, my attempt at murder was 1990 fucking nine, so that was a mistake I made. Now, bearing in mind when I get this right, I mean, the first paragraph doesn't also mention that it was me who went to John Butcher to ask him would he consider taking on the review. It wasn't fucking Northumbria Police. The second paragraph says this. I reiterate here what you have been told on numerous other occasions, that this piece of work, which was conducted by Bedfordshire Police at the request of Northumbria Police, and it is therefore an issue for Northumbria Police as to what they provide or do not provide to you, it says on this review. It goes on to say, it is only Northumbria Police who come to say this. I am aware that Bedfordshire Police are writing separately to you on this point, which they did do because John Boucher passed the book and he actually brought in his legal department, the head of legal in Bedfordshire Police, to write to me because he the, he was starting to get turned up on him. It goes on to say, I want to be very clear here in informing you that Operation Canova will not communicate with you further on this point, and any further, it says, uh, future communications from you to Operation Canova are indeed. <laughs> to the former Chief Constable of Bedfordshire Police, John Butcher, on this point, will not be responded to. So that's it. Sorry for ranting on, but that is really the, 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 that's the gist of what's happened. I have taken you through every aspect of how I became involved with Canova, how I contacted them, who I spoke to, how I came into contact with John Butcher, how I decided that I wanted to ask him to take on the review, which he accepted. I made all the contact with him. I made the request, not Northumbria Police. John Boucher decided to take it on. I have got emails and letters from John Boucher to say that he is the actual overall control of the review, but day-to-day -day, um, responsibility has been passed to his deputy, uh, Assistant Chief Constable Paul Fullwood, who was at the meeting, and under him, two reviewing officers and other people are going to be working with them, right? But John Boucher made it very clear, and it's in black and white in terms of reference, which I insisted on being given a copy of, and which I was given a copy of back in 2017. And John Boucher's name's all over the fucking document, because John Boucher obviously was very vocal about he wanted it known that he was the man in charge. And then here I have this letter getting sent to me, whenever the fucking cooker starts to fucking be turned up and whenever things are starting to get a bit too hot to handle and he's getting his deputy from Conover to write to me to tell me Bedfordshire Police did this and you should go back to Bedfordshire Police and Bedfordshire, Bedfordshire Police are going to write to you again and he's trying to basically airbrush fucking John Butcher, his boss completely out of the fucking, you know, history as if he was never involved in it. 
And he's also telling me, not only that, Mr. McCartney, but don't write to us again about it because we're not going to speak to you. In other words, the door's closed. It's never going to be opened again. You can bang on it as hard as you fucking want. You're not going to get any information. So what he's telling me is the promise of the, the review reports. I'm never going to get it. All the questions I've been asking fucking for every day since John Butcher completed his review report about my case are never going to be answered. And I've just been told, fuck off. I, I, I'm shocked that the door was closed so tightly there. I mean... You were told basically in no uncertain terms that they wouldn't even be responding to to emails from you. I think a lot of people would like to know what is life like for you now? You've spent decades looking over your shoulder, living in secrecy, worried that your life could be taken at any point you've escaped murder at least twice that you know of do you still live every day in fear i have been left completely to my own devices to make decisions that nobody else would ever be expected to make i mean sometimes when i look back i think to myself fuck me you think i was a mass murderer you think i had been a terrorist you think I was running around fucking killing people and bombing people and had done re- really evil things in life to deserve this sort of fucking, like, really, really horrible existence? Because cause what happens is, these people, just every single time I, I seem to think, well, I've, I've got over one hurdle and my life seems to be sort of like going, uh, there's no normal. My life will never be normal because of the the, 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 the actual psychological on the physical disabilities that I have to live with every, every day, which really are profound. I mean, I can't really articulate how bad they are, but they have a really, really profound effect in my life every single day, from the morning I get up until, obviously, I go to bed at night. And when I go to bed at night, I don't go to bed like most people. I stay awake, and sometimes I don't get much sleep. But what I'm saying is, it's an existence. It's not a life. Some people might like to hear it. Some people will love to hear it because they think, ah, oh, fuck him. He's got a horrible life. There's nothing but more than he deserves. But I just say, you know what? I, I've already said, you know, I actually know why I'm in this position. But you know what? I shouldn't be in a position like this because the people who I actually helped, the people who I did everything that they actually asked of me on more, on some, I went more than the extra mile. I had hoped that they would actually like honour their sort of obligation and their commitment towards me, and not only me, other people, other people in the same position, other people who were agents who infiltrated terrorist organisations, both loyalists and Republicans, have been fucked away to the the wayside whenever they have outlived their usefulness, just because the, the security services and special branch don't like what they say. If I had been here saying to you, you know what? See the special branch, they're fucking the most loveliest people on the planet, and see the MI, MI5, the salt of the earth. I'll tell you that if that's exactly the truth, but the top, the, the truth, that is not, it, it, it's like the complete opposite. I mean, I'm not going to fucking lie to you, I'm going to tell you as it is, because I mean, at the end of the day, listen, I mean, I got no, I've got nothing to gain by sitting here telling you stuff that's completely wrong, because people will, will be coming along to say to you, well, here's proof that what he said to you there is not true, here's more proof to, to prove that, that what he said to you is not true. They will be queuing up to try and discredit me. But the problem is, they can never discredit me because I got evidence to back up everything I fucking say. I am never, ever going to be able to live any sort of a normal life until the day that I leave this fucking earth. And you know what? I just hope and pray that if there is someone looking down on me, that it's I'm here for a long time to come because I've got fucking a lot of stuff that I want to do. And you know what? I would be really, really, really fucking angry if I thought that I was going to be fucking going anytime soon. Because I'll tell you what, a lot of people will be rubbing their hands with glee because you know what? If I was actually going tomorrow, it would make their life a lot more fucking uh, easy. And that's something that I wouldn't be able to actually fucking... I would be turning in my grave if I thought the security services and the special branch and all the other fucking crown departments and organs of the state were actually going to be able to get off the hook for what they've done and what they continue to do on me. You've said this previously, Martin, and... I thought it was very powerful. 
you feel that you were treated worse by the security services, the people who you were working for, who were supposed to be protecting you, than the IRA treated you and they tried to murder you at least twice? If I, you know, look back to the damage that the IRA done me, and just to give you a couple of examples, kidnapped, going to be tortured, going to be murdered, executed, you know, my family, my mum's house, trying to firebomb my mum's house when she was in bed at night sleeping, you know, my brother taken away and fucking virtually, like, crucified, fucking hung upside down, beaten, virtually nearly fucking to death by people with fucking baseball bats and fucking arm bars and everything. My sister with the young kids getting put out of her house. Moss cards been sent to my mum's house, house in the form of death threats against me. And then the IRA just basically ridiculing, crucifying, and really harassing and intimidating my whole family for the best part of 30 years, right? All the damage that the IRA have done to me and have tried to done, do, do, including trying to murder me in my own, outside my own home in 1999 when they shot me six times. I have said, and I repeat this, right, that the IRA have not done me anywhere near, anywhere near as much damage as the security services, um, special branch, and the Crown authorities as a whole have done me in that period. I'm telling you, they have fucking put me through absolute fucking hell. It has been a living hell. If there's a such thing as a place which is close to hell, I've been there a few times and back again, and no doubt it'll be there a few more times before I leave this planet.